Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Seri Cho Dobson, Professor of Graphic Design and Chair of Studio Arts at LMU. On behalf of the Department of Arts and Art History and the Ruben Gallery, I welcome you to Caledo LA today. Today's presentation will address the lack of equity and inclusion in the field of graphic design and how BIPOC can be proactive in creating platforms and projects that help elevate their voices and give them agency by controlling their narratives, especially when creating work for diverse audience and for people in their communities. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the host of today's conversation, Tashika Arsenal Sutton. Tashika is Associate Professor of Graphic Design at Southeastern Louisiana University and also faculty in the MFA program in the graphic design at Vermont College of Fine Art. Tushika is the principal of Black Voice Design Studio. Black Voice does work for small businesses, educational institutions, and nonprofit organizations. Tushika's research focuses on the discovery of Black people who have been omitted from the graphic design history. Welcome Tushika to Kaleido LA. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sari. And thanks to everyone at the Loyola Marymount University community. Thanks for having me here today and um, being a part of this uh, very important conversation. So I just want to talk a little bit about the format of today's um, presentation. So I have um, sharing a virtual spotlight with me today is Karen Ewan, as well as Aldrina Hicks Carter. Um, I will give a brief 10-minute, uh, actually I'm going to show like a 10-minute video, and then the, on the three of us will have a discussion about um, my presentation. Then I will introduce the next presenter, and the three of us will have um, a dialogue about uh, that particular discussion and therefore, After all the presentations, then we'll leave it open. Um, for question and answers that you can post um, in the chat. So um, some other things that I wanted to uh, highlight, especially um, in the video that I'll be showing is these uh, ideas of collaboration, improvisation, and isolation. Um, these are themes that I think all of us are probably experiencing right now during the time of COVID. And so um, I'm going to share my screen and I have a 10 minute video that I want to show. Hello, welcome to the gallery here at Red Cat in Los Angeles. My name is Michael Worthington. I teach in the graphic design program at CalArts, and I'm also the curator of this show, Inside Out and Upside Down, posters from CalArts 1970 to 2019, in collaboration with Tashika Arseno Sutton and Silas Monroe. The exhibition design was developed through a collaborative process, working with a group of MFA students at CalArts. The structure centers around a metaphor of CalArts as its own cultural ecosystem with the sections of the exhibition reflecting that. The gallery contains wooden trees with posters hanging from their branches and solid bush-like structures are scattered throughout the central space. Hanging from the ceiling is a cloud of floating posters designed for events at Red Cat. The viewer can walk through these. The archive was started by faculty members, Carrie Aramoto Mercer and Shelley Stepp following the Northridge earthquake of 1993. Carrie and Shelley felt a sense of loss after the earthquake, and they started to work to preserve the posters, those most ephemeral pieces of culture. The archive built slowly over the next two decades into an important repository for graphic design, and also it became a visible history of events that had happened at CalArts. In 2015, the graphic design program created an online database of the posters. This involved shooting all of the posters, putting the images up online, and crowdsourcing missing information. The 
program also created a physical archive in a dedicated space on the CalArts campus. We also produced a 400 page publication highlighting posters from the collection with 70 different covers designed by students, faculty and alumni. The last part of the plan for the archive was to have an exhibition of posters. I worked for a year with MFA students at CalArts to design and curate the exhibition. A few weeks before we were due to begin installing, COVID hit and the show was put on hold. During that time, I was working on an online live event space for CalArts called Thurs.Night. And as the issues surrounding Black Lives Matter came to the fore, it became clear that the larger context of these issues was impossible to ignore. With Thurs Night, the curator, Madeline Falcone, had opened up that space to include other voices, specifically inviting the Black Artists Collective at CalArts to take over the curation of the space for a number of weeks. And this became a model for rethinking this show inside out. We questioned the role of the institution, the archive, and ideas around inclusion and exclusion. During Thursday night, I also reconnected with two graphic design alumni, Tashika Arsenal Sutton and Silas Monroe, and I invited them to create a critical response to the show from the perspective of Black designers at CalArts. Hi, I'm Tashika Arsenal Sutton, and I graduated from the MFA in graphic design program at CalArts in 2007. I'm currently an associate professor of graphic design at Southeastern Louisiana University in Hammond, and I live 50 miles south of Hammond in New Orleans, Louisiana, where I was born and raised. I'm Silas Monroe. I'm an alumni of CalArts' MFA in graphic design program from 2008. I run a design studio called Polymode, and I also teach at Otis College of Art and Design and advise students at Vermont College of Fine Arts. When Tashika and I were asked to make a critical intervention in the exhibition, we started with thinking about what was missing in the archives. And the intervention eventually was conceived as having multiple parts. So the main part of the exhibition that you feel in the space is a series of texts that weave through the spaces of the posters that Tashika and I both generated. When I thought about how could I respond to the exhibition um, because of the lack of Black voices that was currently in the archive, that really made me think about my experience at CalArts, which is why I approached writing my essay from a very personal perspective. Part of my experience um, as a student had a lot to do with me constantly questioning where are the Black people in graphic design, where are the Black people in graphic design at CalArts, where are the Black people um, in the history of graphic design canon, where are the Black graphic designers at CalArts. To those five Black students, I regret not asking them if they shared the same feelings of isolation and lack of confidence as I did. If they exhibited insecurities that negatively affected their work. I never asked them if they ever felt embarrassed or frustrated by not being able to name one Black person who made a significant contribution to the graphic design canon. I never asked them if the lack of role models left them feeling trapped in the strategy of imitating an aesthetic of people who are culturally, socially, and economically different from them. Maybe they didn't feel trapped in the way that I did. I always felt good and confident in my knowledge about Black history, Black culture, and Black identity. I struggled to find my voice. Not knowing or having any knowledge about Black graphic designers left me feeling voiceless. My text is called Unseen Objects and is more in the form of poetry than prose compared to Tashika's text. I do a lot of oscillating between the micro, my experience, and the macro of being a person of color in America and also in the field of design. And I'm going to read 
a portion of that. Black is the color of the pigment in the placa imported from Switzerland. It's also the melanin in the skin of W.E.B. Du Bois. Black is a swatch of enamel painted on the steel frame of the Eames house. Black is a tint that's not printed in the history books of graphic design, except for a token here or there, an inadequate symbolic gesture of acknowledgement, a drop of color in the asterisk in the footnotes of the index of your archive. Black is the color of bodies, brutally murdered in cold blood for all to witness, murdered by those who are supposed to protect us, bodies like mine, faces like mine. And here you come to ask me to educate you on fragility management, triage because you can't seem to grasp my own rage that you try to manage, charge me with the responsibility of the plantation, but pay me only wages to pick the cotton, ask me to earn the accolades that your cronies have pre-selected or more likely rejected by the not so secret handshake that says European American high modernism. Going from our written texts to applying those texts into the space of the exhibition was really this experience of dialogue between Tashika and I, both in terms of setting typographic voice to each of our texts. Both of us are really drawn to the type design of Josh Darden, who's one of the few black type designers. I used a typeface called Halyard and she used a typeface called Freight. And part of the process of putting our text into space was different passes of Tashika, who is like an initiator, started the process and kind of blocked out text. And then as me as a bit of a finisher came in and would respond and finesse. One of the most challenging parts of designing the intervention was how to treat the part of my text where I start listing the names of Black people that have been murdered at the hands of police or other injustices in the United States. And I'm really grateful to Tashika for taking the lead on this part of typesetting the names. She made the bold decision to set all the names large on one of the walls in the gallery. And I feel like her design decision gave my text permission to take up space and to hold space for those lost. This part of the exhibition really relies on this list of names where we also add our own names at the end as a symbolic gesture to stand in for the vulnerability of being a Black person in this country right now. And also our frustration and hope that this changes and needs to change now. Okay, so um, I just wanna take a, a couple of minutes and um, I wanna read my essay in an, um, its entirety. Where is the Black graphic designers at CalArts? Not many Blacks have been fortunate enough to attend the CalArts graphic design program. Not many at all. I started putting together a list of Black designers at CalArts, and so far, there are 20 people on that list, including myself. Let me break it down. Over 25 years, from 1995, to 2020, an estimated 20 Black students graduated from the graphic design program at CalArts. That is less than 1% of the graphic design students. I believe this list is incomplete, although I'm unsure to what degree, and it only goes as far back as 1995. So many people are missing between, so many people are missing between 1970 and 95. I sent my list to Lorraine Wilde, 
to see if she could help me fill in the gaps and give me some names before 1995. And she said, your list is interesting and to be frank, humiliating. And I agree, it's ridiculous. When I attended Kellogg's visiting day, I don't remember being worried or concerned about the possibility of being the only black person in the program. I was the only black potential student at the visiting day, but that didn't bother me either. I was happy to be invited. I remember being in a graduate critique room when MFA students presented their work. I have no idea what the students' presentations were about because to the right of me was a wall filled from top to bottom with visiting artists' lecture posters. And I found myself staring at the posters the whole time, wondering, was it possible for me to make posters like this? I was accepted into the three-year track, which was for people who either didn't have an undergraduate degree in graphic design or who lacked graphic design experience. And in my case, it was both. Every fall semester, the first MFA activity is a group project called the Design Charette. For my first year, the project was titled Design a Monumental Style, a line pulled from Paul Feck's teaching notes. We were encouraged to interpret the prompt as we liked. We had a week to create the design. One of our groups built a full-size car made out of cardboard. On the hood of the vehicle was a Confederate flag. Maybe it was on the side or both. I remember walking into the room right before the critique and seeing the Confederate flag. My stomach began to feel uneasy. And all I could think of was, here we go. Really, Callie? I could have stayed in Louisiana for this. Seeing a Confederate flag on a car left me questioning whether or not I had made the right decision. I don't think I'm overly sensitive, but I wonder why did they have to use that symbol? This is CalArts. So here, students here are supposed to be smart, creative, and inventive. Why use a Confederate flag, especially if it served no purpose but to reference the Duke of Hazzard's iconic car, the General Lee? Was it satire? Was it supposed to be funny? During the critique, I believe it was Lorraine Wow or maybe Michael Worthington. My memory is a little fuzzy. Who asked the students if they considered the history of the Confederate flag and what that symbol stood for? To me, that was semiotics 101. The students all stood looking confused and eventually embarrassed, but still trying to defend their bad decision by saying, we didn't mean it that way. The discussion continued to address how it can be considered offensive to some people. Well, I was some people. I was the elephant in the room. This was my first critique. There were only four students in my class. I was the only black student in the graphic design program, period. The students stated that they did not intend to promote white supremacy, that the design had nothing to do with that. We all knew and understood the Dukes of Hazzard reference to the General Lee car, but still not a good idea. Because of me, a black person, that flag represents hate, inequality, justice, pain, and racism. Honestly, I don't remember all the details. I know the faculty chastised them for using the Confederate flag and being naive, ignorant, and careless by incorporating it into their design. I do remember what I said to them. I said that since I was the only black person in the program and perhaps the only person who may or may not be offended, someone should at least ask me how I feel about it or how I felt about it. The fact that no one thought to have a conversation with me about it, that it didn't even cross their minds, was so disappointing. After the critique, I believe three out of the four students in the group apologized to me. Still the main culprit, the student who had the idea to include the Confederate flag, did not apologize. During the second semester of my first year, I began wondering, when was the last time there was a Black student in the program? Where were the Black graphic designers at CalArts? I asked the faculty this question, and I also asked this question in my work over and over and over again. I began to, I began to ask this question at CalArts and in the field of graphic design as a whole. During my second year, Cameron Union, Ewing, a Black student, joined my class. And during my last year, Silas Monroe, another Black student, entered the program. Between 2006 and 2007, my last year at CalArts, there were five Black students in both the undergraduate and graduate programs. To those five students, I regret not asking them 
if they shared the same feelings of isolation and lack of confidence as I did, if they exhibited insecurities that negatively affected their work. I never asked them if they ever felt embarrassed or frustrated by not being able to name one black person who had made a significant contribution to the graphic design canon. I never asked them if the lack of role models left them feeling trapped in a strategy of imitating an aesthetic of people who are culturally, socially, and economically different from them. Maybe they didn't feel trapped in the way, but I did. I always felt good and confident in my knowledge about Black history, Black culture, and Black identity. I struggled to find my voice. Not knowing or having any knowledge about Black graphic designers left me feeling voiceless. Thank you. So Cameron and um, Aldrina can join in. First, let me say that was powerful. Thank you, Tashika. Listen, I know your story uh, from you know the point of view of a colleague, um, but it is powerful to see the body of work that you've curated with Silas, his presentation, and your really thoughtful uh, uh, piece that you've read for us. So I just want to start by saying thank you. Thank you, Cameron. I appreciate that. Yeah, all in the fields. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the day that our flag actually off came down off of the Capitol of the South Carolina building. Um, there was a big rally and we got to march around that a momentous day. Um, so to hear your experience about that um, kind of brings up those feelings again. Um, and also, um, I want to say that because of you, you're one of the reasons I actually applied and uh, went to VCFA because I um, was looking for a place where I could have a voice and, um, of course, looked at the faculty and who was teaching there and saw you um, and literally was like, I have to go there because I need to meet you. So. <laughs> So thank you. So your letter to those five students um, is beautiful. I mean, I felt a sense of kinship, but loneliness and still learn, yearning for that connection that you were wanting to have. Um, do you still feel that way in this profession, whether it's graphic design and or teaching? Do you still feel that you're alone, even though we know that there's a lot of us in this space, but do you still feel that way? And then how important is Black visibility to you in your own work now that um, you've matured and gone further in your career? Well, um, I don't feel as isolated as I used to. I can definitely say that. And I think that sometimes I have to compartmentalize it because there are moments where I feel it on my, um, in my institution where I teach at um, because I'm the only Black person um in the department the only black faculty <laughs> which we all wear those hats right um but i mean I, I do have colleagues that i you know i love and and we get along fine but there are moments where i do feel like i i still haven't been given the ticket or i'm still on the outside looking in um so there are definitely moments where i do still feel that isolation but on the other side um as far as the design community uh, as a whole um, I've really, really tried my best to kind of force collaborations and be a part of collectives. So even for instance, when I was asked to, to give this talk, I didn't want to do it by myself, right? So, you know, of course I pulled the two of you in because I thought it was important. And I think that's what's important is even if you have a similar story, it's important for everybody to get a chance to tell their story in their perspective, because you know, Aldrina, you might have a different story of isolation or not. And Cameron, you might have a different perspective from being a man, being a, um, uh, a man of mixed color, <laughs> you know, biracial. So, you know, all, all that matters. So I can say that a lot of my, you know, um, my, my practice has been about bringing other people in. And so even that project that Silas and I worked on, you know, we were very conscious about being the black people to be the black spokes, spokesman persons of the CalArts black community. And so we, you know, invited other people to come in and have a conversations around that topic. Um, 
As far as in my work, yes. Um, and on the same line, so on the one hand, it sounds like I'm frustrated with being maybe the token of the other of, or the only one. But on the flip side, I think it's important as me as a black woman to acknowledge that because there are still not enough people that know about our stories. And so therefore that, you know, me being a black person from New Orleans, like what, what that means in regards to my work, all those things, all those aspects of me makes, you know, who I am and, and then definitely contributes to who I am as a designer. And may I build on that? Uh, I'm just kind of curious to see, we're, we're kind of now a generation, right? Uh, of like academics, of practitioners. What trends are you seeing with the current generation? Are things optimistic? Is it the same? I'm just kind of curious with your perspective. Um, I, I feel optimism. Um, sometimes I, I will admit, and I think maybe more of it I see, I experience with my graduate students. And I don't know if that's because they're older, more experienced, more mature. Um, whereas my undergrads, you know, they're still a little bit more of you know, if I'm honest, like pushing them, <laughs> you know, it's like, come on, we have some real things we need to talk about and discuss. And so, you know, even if, you know, I'm not trying to force them to do social political work, I'm not trying to force them to be activists, but I do want them to know that it's important to have conversations and to be aware. And even if, you know, you know, they might be having projects that's like, oh, I just want to design a series of wedding invitations. So I'm constantly poking like, why? Why should anybody care? Why is that important? You know, so yeah, I'm optimistic. I, I was saying in the end, I'm optimistic. Um, I definitely see some trends where I, I see more and more students are sort of tapping into who they are and their heritage and, you know, interested in um, learning more about themselves. I guess, in their family and bringing that into their work. Love that answer. Thank you. OK, well, let's um, move on to our next guest, Aldrina Hicks Carter. Aldrina is a maker, designer, and educator. She's the owner of Adrena Carter LLC and This Little Brown Girl, a company that promotes positive images of Black women and girls through art and design. Ms. Carter is also Assistant Professor of Art and Design at Columbia College of South Carolina, where she serves as Chair of the Art Department. Carter serves as a mentor to local young professionals and has served on AIGA's Diversity and Inclusion Task Force. Adrena earned her BA in Studio Art at Columbia College of South Carolina and earned her MFA in Graphic Design from Ramon College of Fine Arts in 2016. Her thesis, A Little Brown Girl, Essays on the Influence of Black Womanhood and Visual Communication, focuses on the subjects of hair, skin, and self-love. This work was featured in IDA 2019 International Design Award Annual and Print Magazine's 2017 Regional Design Award Annual. She has presented at AIGA's 2017 Design Conference, AIGA's New York Fresh Grad Program, and participated in exhibitions at the University of Maryland Eastern Shores Mosley Gallery and at the Goodell Gallery at Columbia College of South Carolina. Adrena was selected as the 2018 Nina Towson Ballin Visitor Professor of New Mexico Highlands University in Las Vegas. During her residency, she held lectures and conducted workshops that helped students explore their own identities in their work through writing, media, and visual communication. Recently, Adrena published a children's book, You Are a Queen, based on her thesis. Her most recent work, Unraveled by Miss Taylor's Portrait, is the cover art artwork of the August 2020 edition of Louisville Magazine. Her mission is to help creators of color, particularly Black, particularly black women, realize their voice has value in their work. Currently, Aldrina lives in South Carolina with her family. Welcome. I have to go, who are you talking about? She sounds awesome. I need to get to know her. <laughs> Hi, everybody. 
or good afternoon. I think it's lunchtime over where y'all are. Um, we're nearing the end of the day. So what I'm gonna do is share a little bit about my thesis and my experience at New Mexico Highlands University, and then transition into how I came about publishing, self-publishing my book, um, You Are a Queen, which is again, based off of my thesis um, at VCFA. Hopefully everyone can see this. Yes, we can. Awesome. So I'm not good at memorizing things, so I have notes. <laughs> so anyway, the title of this is Whose Story Is It Anyway? The Power of Telling One's Own Story, um, particularly um, Black women um, stories and women people of color. So. So again, my thesis, This Little Brown Girl, discusses the influence of media communications um, that it's had on Black womanhood and the impact that Black womanhood has had on the media as well. And so uh, it's told through personal narratives and essays that touch on, again, hair, skin, color, um, skin color, and Black love. The skin I'm in um, focuses on um, the history of colorism, which is an in, um, internal form of racism, um, usually within one's own race. Um, and what it's like to be judged by the lightness or darkness of your skin. Um, and then talking about self-discriminatory practices, such as um, the comb test, where you would test your, the fineness of your hair. Oh, sorry, that's the hair version. But the paper bag test, where you would test your skin color up against the paper bag. And if it was darker, then you were not accepted into certain realms. Um, so how these things internalize and then lead to things, bad practices like skin lightening. Then better than good hair, this section uh, reveals the complex and emotional struggle and celebration of a black woman's hair. Um, and I share my own personal journey and struggle to love and accept my hair no matter what state she's in, whether it's relaxed or natural or anything in between and what that meant um, in the workplace and um, overall. And then finally, this section deals with um, loving, loving oneself um, as a black person. Um, we see a lot of the black girl magic and all of that stuff happening now, but that's a, that's a journey that we all take and no one's story is the same, no one person's story is the same, no one's experience is the same. But in this particular section of the book of my thesis, I talked about my own arrival and journey and continued journey um, in this process to love me as who I am in my black skin and then teaching my children and those around me how to love the love themselves. This is also um, at the end of this is where I wrote a letter to my daughter explaining things that would come up as she's growing and learning to accept and love who she is. But we'll talk a little, little later about you are a queen. So what this uh, thesis did set me on an amazing journey. Y'all heard some of the things that I got to present at. But um, it also gave me the opportunity to share and play with the students at New Highlands, New Mexico University. Um, Highlands University in New Mexico, Las Vegas, New Mexico, where I spent two weeks um, playing and just learning stories and about um, the students there. A large number of the students there um, are of Hispanic and um, Native American descent. So we had a time learning how to um, navigate that and I learned a lot of good things from them. But during my time there, we we played around with, um, I met amazing faculty. I was able to discuss personal and um, issues as it relates to their own heritage, our heritage. Um, and then we started incorporating what it felt like to um, share our stories. And then what was important to us, if someone else is telling our story, how we want that story presented. Right before I arrived, um, number 45, um, made a big announcement or many uh, offensive announcements, but this one sort of hit real home where we were talking about um, how folks of Mexican and Native American descent were 
drug drug dealers and rapists. So we tackled that straight on when, when I arrived there because there was no way to get around that. So we came up with an ex exhibition. I worked with students in the writing program, also um, with the graphic design, their, their visual arts program. So it was a collaborative effort um, where they wrote personal stories and our our theme ended up being I am. And so what we talked about was the um, I am and then who who we are not speaking against the the norms the the, per, the perceived perceptions of folks based on stereotypes racism bias and um, and then we flipped it and then talked about how we are not those things so lots of uh, powerful very personal stories that were shared and we wanted to handle that and treat that with respect and care that um, that it was so deserving of. But when we talked about, um, as we talked about that, the, the work of Chimamanda Ngoji Adichie came up. And this, we showed this story about uh, her TED talk about the danger of a single story. And this stuck out to us, this quote, the problem with stereotypes is that they're not untrue, but they are incomplete. And they make one story become the only story. And so she acknowledges the dangers of taking this single story and making it the entire um, story about a person, a culture, a, a particular history. And so we were we addressed that and talked about how we would want people to talk about us and then how we talk about ourselves in our work, in our lives, and then what what historical, what uh, familiar things happened to us growing up. Not all of it is bad, not all of it was um, traumatic, but at the same time, we recognize the power in storytelling and being able to own one story. And so uh, um, Aditya again goes on to say, you know, how stories are told, um, that's where the power is. And so if you start with the arrows um, of the Native American and not the arrival of folks overseas coming here from England, um, then you have a different story, right? So learning where to start the story and share that. We also discussed myths and truths and how this plays into um, plays into our storytelling and how folks are how folks view us and how we view ourselves. And so this is um, Daniel Guillory, who is, at the time was the head desk, um, head um, diversity and inclusion person at um, Autodesk. And so he gave this presentation at a diversity inclusion conference and challenged us on certain myths and how they're not true today. Some of these are the earth is flat, men cannot fly, Blacks are intellectually inferior, gay marriage can exist, and then women can, cannot lead. We know all of these things are not true, right? Um, but at the same time, how these things in, um, created laws, um, how we interacted with each other, how we interact with the world around us, and how these things guide us um, on our journeys. So then, um, we wanted to discuss, well, what are we doing to add to this library of visual literacy? What are we contributing um, stories about ourselves or others in this space um, as we tell stories? You know, what particular, especially when we're talking about particularly women of color and people of color, what are we adding to this library um, to help debunk these myths, to show that we are more than a monolith? There's a lot more to us than just the things that we see on TV or in the media, I mean, in the in the movies and in the papers and especially on the news, right? So these are some of the things that some of the women's studies group that I worked with, they wrote their personal narratives and I'm just gonna share snippets of some of the things that they had come up with as they dealt with their own personal um, struggles. I don't know who I am or where I'm going today, but that is okay. I know the path will continue and I will be able to define myself once again. Don't be smart, don't be successful, but instead keep your mouth shut, do what you're told and look pretty doing it. 
so for me the question is is it still viable that my voice is heard by some while it is aggressively rejected by most sometimes it's too unbearable so i think maybe i don't need any activism at all in my life i haven't had much experience with oppression because i'm a white male in today's society no one ever said or did anything mean to me but they would treat me differently but just the feeling of not fitting into the culture around me made me feel isolated almost every day. I have always been the only female in, a, in most social settings. I always hung out with boys slash men because that is what I was used to growing up. And they never once singled me out for being a girl. My classroom was a pond of blonde hair and I was the drop of mud right in the middle. I managed to muddle through. I was 24, I now had a nine month old daughter that was going to look up to me and more than likely follow my example. I am a warrior who has faced great obstacles and made it through and now I have the experience to be able to be who I want to be. My Sorry about that. <laughs> so as we worked with the graphic design, as I worked with the graphic design and visual media folks, we came up with a video um, where we wanted to express who we are and who we are not. So they wrote about their experiences and then the essence of their stories in these video essays. Things from, I'm not a drug dealer, I'm not a target, I am strong. Um, but we want to keep in mind the vulnerability of sharing this work and to bear one's soul. And then how we wanted to keep this sacred, but at the same time acknowledge um, acknowledge these things publicly um, so it doesn't become a spectacle. So again, writing in the affirmative, you know, speaking on pride, speaking on their heritage um, and how um, proud they are of who they are, um, no matter the sexual orientation, gender, all of that good stuff. And then on the flip side, again, rejecting the story stereotypes and the shame um, because of these things that growing up, whether it's in family or um, around us, so. So what does this have to do with my book? What does this have to do with You Are a Queen? Um, at the time when I first got onto this journey to write this book, I wasn't ready. This book was already in the works and it was based on a letter again, like I said, that um, spoke to my, my young daughter, but I wasn't ready. So after this experience, this amazing two week experience in New Mexico, I felt now I was ready to put this in here, but this was a new level of vulnerability that I was um, scared to share. But, you know, we're all told to do this, to do this, do things scared, but just keep moving. But I felt at that time, um, I wasn't ready. My voice, nobody wants to hear this, but <laughs> even with all the black girl magic happening, nobody wants to hear another story about, you know, young girls, black girls doing all the things. But after that um, encounter with these amazing students and faculty there, I felt that it was time to go ahead and step out of that comfort zone and, and share this because if I was growing up feeling like no one else understood where I came from, even though I had an amazing support system and pow grew up around powerful, beautiful black women, um, I still felt like um, I was alone. I didn't want other girls and other women to feel that way. So what I'm gonna read from you is an excerpt of the letter, the actual letter that I wrote to my daughter. And then we'll talk about why I chose um, the certain direction that I chose with uh, my, my book for her, to her. My darling girl, the day you were born, my initial reaction was not immediately of joy, but of fear. My mind raced toward the future, a future to where you would be covered by the labels and stereotypes that had been created for you. And I was sad because those labels are hard to shake off, to break out of and destroy, especially if you believe them. 
but oh my love, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are a rare gem. You belong to a strong people. You have running through your veins, the blood of artists, musicians, makers. Our family tapestry is woven with the most beautiful shades from the darkest of midnight to the brightest of the Northern star. Now I tell you this not to be intimidated or make you feel like you can't measure up, but to let you know the power of your lineage. That same power resides in you. Hear and remember the stories, draw upon them. There will come a time where people will tell you you're not light enough or skinny enough, that your hair isn't straight or long enough. And for a little while, you may change desperately to fit their definition of beautiful. But remember my love, how precious you are, how lovely your brown skin and your black cottony hair are. Rise up little goddess and discover then claim who you are. Remember you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Seize your power and take on the world. Love, mommy. So when it was time to do this book, um, I thought about my own experiences, how I wanted to make the story that I was telling in the images as I creative, um, creative um, and art directed this piece. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I was adding to the visual literacy, something that was going to be um, cherished and honor, honorable. I wanted my viewers, I wanted my readers, my daughter, my nieces, myself to be seen. I wanted auto autonomy over how this story would be presented. And that was part of the reason why I self-published. So I didn't want to have to haggle with editors um, and have to explain to them um, the way that I wanted this to go down. An editor did approach me, a publisher did approach me to do, to do this, but at the time I wasn't ready. So then I, when I was ready, I decided the self-publishing was the route to go. So, but more importantly, I didn't want to have to explain, okay, in the images, her hair needs to be kinky and not straight. Her skin color needs to be this way. Um, the, the people in the book, um, surrounding the story need to have value, different tones. I wanted to be able to say that and not get pushback and also not have to explain why and why that was important. So that was the reason that I went with and chose to work with women of color, black women, um, this, so this experience. And we shared an experience. We even, well, as we worked, talked about certain things that happened growing up or things we're experiencing now and how some of these were triggers but not necessarily in a bad way um, of how this all went down. So I purposely and intentionally chose black women to work with me on this since I'm showcasing this and this is for black girls. So this book is entirely uh, produced and designed um, with um, black women and in mind and for black women. So I didn't wanna sugarcoat the message. So the letter that I read to you is not the final letter that's in this book. I wanted it to still have the same message, but it needed to reach um, the age group that I was talking to, which at the time was my daughter's age group. She's now nine. I wrote this when she was about six um, or four years old. So that, that particular demographic. But it was also a letter to myself, the little brown girl within. Um, you know, to thinking back on the things that I had gone through and things I would want to be shared later on. So that's why I intentionally asked them to my artists, my my writers to to take that into consideration as they edited um, and drew the books. So when we talked about um, the sketches and we were talking about the the heritage and all of that. Um, when we're talking about the, the lineage of, of people, I intentionally asked her, my illustrator, Naja Clemens, to make all of the ancestors or people in here women, because I want my girls, the girls who are reading this book and experiencing the book to see how important it is that they see women in various roles. And then of course, these, um, these uh, avatars, if you will, actually are based on 
um, people in our lives or somebody that I know um, and, or my daughter would recognize. And of course, the artist is mommy. <laughs> so I didn't want to have to explain they need to have varying skin tones. I didn't want to explain that they need to have various hairstyles. And she got it. My artist got it. Um, so the book right now, I think we're at maybe a little a close to 100 copies sold. Um, and I've gotten posts and letters and messages from women older than me, women my age, and the littles. Um, like I said, this book, while it is written in a children's book format, it really is to all the little brown girls within us because I want everyone to see how powerful and wonderful they are. Um, and just to really share and enjoy um, the fact that the, the world may try to count us down or count us out, but there's power in this. You know, I'm wearing the shirt today that says, listen to black women. So um, I've been blessed to have um, many letters and videos posted, um, still waiting on so a lot of book reviews, but to post it about this, about um, how this experience, how the book has helped them find their own voice. Um, and it's it's been a wonderful journey on that. So what I'm sharing with you now is... Thank you for my book. Take on the book. Say thank you. Thank you. Say I love it. I love it. It's one of the most uh, recent videos that I've gotten from um, an auntie who bought this book for her niece and share it in there. And so the the little girl that you see the in the I am I am a queen, um, that's actually a drawing based on who um, my actual daughter. So my actual daughter, like I have more than you know a fake one somewhere, but <laughs> my daughter. So um, this has been my way to to um, promote and love on us, on me, on them, um, and just to show how beautiful they are and how, how wonderful they are. Um, tomorrow, I'm gonna have a reading with a bunch of girls um, and we're going to discuss the book and we're gonna make crowns because we are queens. And um, this is my way of creating and giving back and lending voice to the women and girls, um, black women and girls in their lives in my life and in, our, in the lives around us. Well, thanks, Audrina, for that. That was fantastic. And I think, I believe that was my first time actually seeing the full story. Um, I guess unravel that way. Um, <laughs> is there another book in you? Probably, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, actually, because I want the grown women to know that this is for them too. So I'm actually going to do a grown woman's version of this book. Um, I'm waiting for a few things to to manifest first before I do that. But I'm going to, like you, I, I love collaboration. So I'm going to actually invite um, a, a couple of artists whose work focuses on the beauty and power of Black women to be a part of this journey. Um, I know a lot of people are like, well, why don't you draw them yourself? Um, no, I'm, I'm an excellent art director and creative director. I'm going to leave that talent to the ones to do that. I can tell them what I want it to look like, and it would probably come out better than me trying to lift a pencil. But yes, there's another book. Um, and then here's the, you know, you've seen this baby, the, the thesis book, right? And so um, I'm still working out the legal stuff on this to get a second edition of this worked out because I feature so many, um, so many uh, examples of, other people's work in here. So it's taking a while to locate and get permission to, to show this um, since this one will actually be for like for sale. So that's, it's, it's a few years in the working, but yes, there is another book in, in there.
You're muted, Cameron, if you have anything to say. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Apologies. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you for taking us on the journey. You know, uh, when we first met, I immediately bought copies of the book for my little girls, and it's been one of our favorites for our bedtime routine. And um, yeah, it's powerful work that you're putting out into the world. And I, uh, I can't just uh, tell you how how um, how proud I, I am just to be a, even like the recipient of the work, uh, how, how important it is for um, you know this 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 sort of literature to be a part, part of our culture. It shouldn't be an anomaly. It should be the norm. So I, I thank you. Yeah, and I just have. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, I just had like one last um, just a comment more than a question about your presentation. Um, the workshop that you did um, in New Mexico, I thought that was really powerful and great. And I think one of my favorite parts was um, the audio, right? It sort of made me think about how, you know, oral culture sometimes isn't, or the, yeah, the oral tradition isn't sometimes valued, but I think it's definitely powerful um, just hearing the audio and not just reading it and as well as the video, seeing the people actually physically write, you know, and transpose in a video. I thought visually both of those things were very powerful. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Yeah, that was um, something that that was intentional in um, on my part. Um, because we're talking about telling stories and how it matters who's telling them. So it was important for the writers to speak those words. So that's not someone else narrating, that's them speaking their words themselves. And so it, it lends, a, it hits different when you hear the actual author or storyteller share that part of them. And um, I, we, we probably have like 20 of them and I can't get through them without getting choked up and crying. And then they're all different. They're not all, you know, sad, you know, trodden, whatever. Some are very, very, very proud to be who they are. Um, and that was also amazing too, because in my mind, I kind of think, oh, everybody's had the sad story and that's not true. So um, it's, it's wonderful to see the gamut of folks who are proud of who they are and then who they are not, so. Well, thank you again, Audrina. That was great. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, last but not least, welcome to the virtual stage, uh, Cameron Ewing, who is, uh, Cameron is currently an executive creative at Facebook. Cameron has been in the creative brand leadership role for 15 years. He is an innovator whose work reaches across all mediums with, with a specialty in story and digital. For the past seven years, he has helped craft a creative and strategic vision for the brands across Facebook's family of apps, including Facebook apps, Messenger, WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, and Facebook company. Cameron is a champion of ideas, diversity, and inclusion. Always striving to work with ambitious brands to challenge conventions and delivery imaginative creative work. Throughout his career, he has pursued creative leadership positions with agency and studio practice in New York, London, Los Angeles, and currently San Francisco. He holds an MFA in graphic design from California Institute of the Arts, a post baccalaureate degree in design at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, and a BA from Princeton University. Cameron stays active in the world of design academia by giving talks and leading a variety of design, topography, branding, and other creative workshops. Welcome, Cameron. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's genuinely a pleasure. Can I do a time check? How much time do I have? I just want to make sure I'm not running over. Do I have 15 minutes? 1.30, stop. That's correct, yes. Okay, great. All right, perfect. Thanks. Just wanted to... Make sure I'm time checked. Um, so thanks for having me. I'm gonna dig right in. Um, it's it's uh, it's a pleasure to be a, a part of this panel and sitting with these peers. And I'm gonna quickly share my screen. Please stand by. And um, there we are. And I need to press play. Um, so. I think the theme of some of the, the work that I'm going to share this afternoon is uh, is similar to what uh, my colleagues have both spoken about, which is where you're not seeing change. I think we all encourage ourselves to be the change. Um, 
Sharing is pause. Bring your shared window to the front. Stand by. I'm gonna see if this works this time. We see your screen. Okay, great. Good, good, good. Thanks. Thank it's you. still on the first slide. Okay, good. I'm gonna move. I'm gonna move forward. Then if this works, yeah, there we are. Um, so the theme uh, is, is be the change. And I'm going to talk uh, about being the change through several different kind of like lenses. Um, first, how we organize. Second, the work. And then third, something I, I hope we all know and love, which is the side hustle. Um, so first, just let me say that, you know, the systemic kind of uh, inequity and racism that we see in our culture and, and really globally in many different ways, this was not organically accidentally stumbled into. It was a, it is a construct. Uh, and if we are going to have a hand and a voice and dismantling and empowering, it needs to be a construct and it needs to be very intentional. So I, I, I say that as, um, as encouraging and empowering words, and I hope that those uh, thoughts are reflected in the work that I share. So first with organize, um, you know, I work at Facebook as Tashika said, uh, and you know, the way that we organize in a very corporate structure, again, is, is very intentional. And so working within that construct, we internally at Facebook, we've, we've organized ourselves, uh, people of color, uh, specifically in the kind of creative departments uh, and come together in one, in one uh, movement, which I'm very proud of. Um, my first quote here is by Mae Jemison, uh, Jemison the uh, very well-renowned African-American astronaut who says, don't let anyone rob you of your imagination, your curiosity, your place in the world. It is your place in life. Uh, and those words ring true, right? We need to own our space and own, own our place. So what we've done is we've organized within the creative department. I won't bore you down with uh, the kind of organizational details, but the people- Excuse are... me, uh, Cameron is still on the first slide. <gasps> I don't know if you have to manage. Right, no, I'm, I'm toggling, I'm moving through. So okay. I, I may have to keep you guys in, in, in this view. I, okay. I hope that's okay. So you're gonna see my, my dirty behind the scenes and my notes, but bear with me. Okay, so our group, our organization uh, that we call internally is called Represent. Um, Represent, this is an initiative that focuses on the retention of, of people of color, the development of this community in the marketing organization uh, to make sure that we're investing, that we are very intentional uh, and that we are growing. Um, this took a lot of lobbying, a lot of, as you can imagine, petitioning, uh, but it has as a, as a group, as an effort, a ton of momentum and backing at the, at the most senior levels, which is really um, encouraging. My role in this initiative is as an executive sponsor, which means I just lend my voice, my guidance, uh, my insight, and give shape to the program. Um, so, you know, for those who have not stepped into the corporate world or the design or professional world, uh, I hope this just kind of illustrates one of the modes, right? One of the modalities of, of kind of um, amplifying voice and magnifying uh, voice and presence. Um, so we also, we develop our talent, we develop our community, right? Where historically there might not have been um, equal opportunity. We wanna actually turn that on its head and make sure there's more than ample opportunity and support. So whether that's awareness and education, we invest heavily in coaching and career growth, and then also the community building component, which means, you know, we are getting people together in real life. Uh, we celebrate, we, we socialize back in the times before the pandemic. These are just a, a few of the shots of, our, I think our last gathering in 2019, um, which is just powerful, right? Uh, you know, I think to, <clears throat> to Sheikah's earlier point, <clears throat> there are just so many scenarios that we step into, whether it be academic or, or cultural or institutional, where we don't see people like us. Uh, and, you know, it's really important <clears throat> that we find our space, we find our community, and empower one another. And then there's really intense and intensive and encouraging programming that goes into it, right? This is not a social club, it has an agenda, which is to, to rise up and unite. Uh, and I'm very proud of the represent work and community. Um, the second uh, kind of point I'd love to land is like the work, right? I think um, to Aldrina's point and also to Sheikah's uh, point, you know, this is this is our craft, this is our superpower being creators. We are makers, we are thinkers. And so it is important that our thoughts on diversity <clears throat> and representation show up in the actual work and output that we make. Um, so I've got a, a few pieces of work that I'm gonna kind of go through very quickly just in the spirit of time. But I, I hope to illustrate not just the work that we're doing internally at Facebook, but also how uh, this these sorts of initiatives are bleeding out through the work and showing up in the way that we communicate with the world. So the first is called the Forward Series. 
Uh, let's see if this plays. So this is a whole series uh, that was uh, basically um, organized to, con to, to kind of highlight the contribution of black artists in our, in our culture, right? I think too often um, the black contribution to the, the global culture goes unrecognized. And this was meant to be a, a platform to highlight and celebrate. We are black history. So this was an idea of, of really Facebook, you know, attempting to get out of our own way and give a platform in the best way we know how, which is to create, you know, um, a vehicle for really talented, well-known and also up and coming um, artists to come speak their truth, to broadcast their art, their story, their background. Um, you know, uh, folks like Chance and Toby and Wigwe and, and Eric and Badu, Miss Badu. Uh, and you know this is this is coming from a small group of creatives who identified an opportunity, who were uh, vocal about um, sharing the stage and emphasizing uh, diversity. And it's a really powerful series. If you guys uh, ever have some time, check it out. There's some really insightful words from these these talented folks. Um, the next project I want to share is called By Black. Um, this was. Uh, again, another initiative, which was like not like a formal ask by the company or the marketing organization, but was a really kind of grassroots an, an initiative in response to um, uh, some of the some of the inequity we, that we saw in culture in America specifically. And the question kind of came up, came up, how do we start to empower our community? How do we give voice? The idea of starting a hashtag by black was was pitched and and um, and shopped around. Uh, and ultimately picked up. So you get you get the sense. One, there was a hashtag. Uh, it gave people the ability to, uh, you know, broadcast themselves on Facebook as a platform, um, uh, and draw attention to themselves. And it was also a vehicle to highlight Black-owned businesses and give them the spotlight. Um, this was a, a takeover on the Facebook page, uh, and also there was a, a, a large campaign kind of highlighting the hashtag. Uh, and really, you know, the idea being putting that tool, that, that spotlight in the people's hands. Um, the last project in this work section is around Black History Month. Um, listen, I think that we all should have our gripes about the construct of the Black History Month, that it is not a moment limited to a month. Uh, but nevertheless, we wanted to make sure that uh, the, our company, our family of apps, were showing up in appropriate ways. One, in the spirit of lifting uh, Black voices. Uh, but also making sure that we're not just uh, paying lip service and we're actually putting our money where our mouth is. Um, so Facebook invested t uh, $10 million over, over the course of two years uh, to invest in Black gaming creator programs uh, and other Black youth programs um, to make sure that, again, like it's, you know, we're addressing one that the playing field is not even and that we need to work very hard and intentionally to make the playing field more even. And uh, one last piece I'll show you here that I'm very proud of. And um, this is a, <clears throat> a campaign film that we shot and produced that features uh, uh, Teresa the Songbird. And um, I think it's a powerful example of creative work that isn't um, downplaying, playing, but rather is of the culture and of the community. 
Um, and uh, it gets me every time, so I'll just play it down quickly. You so black when you smile, the stars come out. You so black when you born, the dog, black the sky. Black the pyramids and black the black the melodies and magic. Big fan of Teresa the Songbird, uh, big fan of her piece, You So Black. And um, it's really a pleasure and I think important and a responsibility for us to uh, put our people, our culture, um, let our next generation see themselves uh, in the media in true and authentic ways. And, and it's a piece that I'm proud of. And then lastly, you know, another thing that our team does is we, we find ways to infuse the actual product with, you know, uh, with. Uh, cultural moments um, that reflect our diverse uh, uh, community and culture. And this was just a small touch, right? It's a very small design gesture, but uh, is seen by, you know, some 3 billion people on a monthly basis. And so the impact is immense. And then lastly, side hustle, and I'll keep it moving. Um, this last point is meant to illustrate, you know, you don't need billions of dollars or millions of dollars or have a big corporate job or a fancy title to make a difference. I think um, we've all illustrated that today. Uh, this is an example that's called Link It Black that was created by um, my colleague, uh, several colleagues. And um, the idea is that um, we need to empower our community um, to really put our, uh, our diverse brothers and sisters first and at the forefront and acknowledge that, the, that the, again, the playing field access has been um, uneven. And so this is a push and a steer to just plug on your LinkedIn profile, on your website, um, the idea that we need to be hiring black, black creatives. So this is uh, a database where you can upload your information and then encouraging the community to point to this, this database um, as, as a really quick and easy shorthand um, to you know, identify black talent, brown talent. Uh, all too often in recruiting rooms and conversations, uh, you know, we hear the excuses. I can't find these people, it's too hard, there aren't enough. We actually know that's not true. Um, and this is a grassroots effort that was homespun uh, and it's got a ton of media press. Uh, I, I encourage you guys to check it out. It's called Link It Black. There's a website. There's also an Instagram handle. Uh, and it's a, just a powerful way to demonstrate that uh, the power is in our hands, uh, not just the corporations. And that's a lot of me. Well, thank you, Cameron. Um, yes. I, um, wow, a lot of these initiatives. Um, so my first time hearing about them. So um, I'm gonna definitely um, look those up. Right. Um, for time purposes, I thought maybe we could open the Q&A from other people. Um, 
uh, from the audience. And Aldrina, if you have a burning question for Cameron, you can go for it. But other people can also type their questions in the chat. So Cameron, you just gave me all kinds of life and I've taken all the notes. I'm like, where are we? <laughs> um, so I'm sure since you work there that you are not oblivious to some of the backlash that Facebook actually has been experiencing in silent and certain voices and things. Um, not too long ago, a friend of mine um, actually was in Facebook jail for something that she posted a while back, just um, cheering Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. um, and this was recent. But um, as an employee there and as a, um, a person in a higher position, do you still feel um, comfortable? I mean, I know that's what you're doing in your work, no, sure. but overall, do you still feel comfortable being able to share your views and your, lend your support to, your, um, to how um, the Black culture or people of color culture um, because the tech has also had some in interesting um, things, so. Yeah, it's a good question. My, you know, I'll be there as long as my voice is heard and as, and as long as I can influence uh, the, the master direction of this thing, even if it's just by hair, right? If that's, if that's, as long as that's my ability, I'm in it. Um, when that's no longer the case, I, I can't, I can't, I couldn't work for any entity that, right, that I don't think is doing the right thing. Um, I'm sorry to hear about your friend's account. We should catch up on the side. I will say it's one of the largest challenges, right? Is that how do you provide really great customer service for 3 billion people? It's a very difficult thing to do, but it's not an excuse. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, what I've just kind of walked through, things like represent, things like um, the Black Lives Matter work, um, you know, these are our responses, you know, to maybe uh, what we see as missteps or missed opportunities. And they don't happen without us inside. So that's what kind of gets me up in the morning. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, thank you. We've Is got some questions? great questions coming here. Tashika on the Q&A from Stuart. Yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to get the... If you see it, you can go ahead and... and sure. Trying to get... um, let's see. I don't want to butcher your name. Um, so I'll just say Muhammad. <laughs> that's your last name um, you this question is asked of all of us do you feel that black as a black artist you're constantly revisiting generational traumas in your personal work and projects what do you do to combat burnout if so anybody want to take that one i'll start really briefly i had to step back uh earlier in the year there was like a lot of uh folks waking up and feeling woke and i and i thought good for you i don't have time for it it's exhausting me i need a break from you uh and so i, I stepped back like you know from from quite a few kind of like initiatives right from my majority peers saying how do i help and i was like i just need to be i need to be so i've been living this my whole life and i'm glad you now know but i i don't have time for it right now so that's how i feel i have breaking points uh i, I caught my breath and i was able to re-engage but it is not easy no. i'd love to hear how you guys feel for some reason i can't see the questions i don't know why i got you okay good um i would say that i definitely feel that especially i've been working on a project off and on um for the past four five years now called black lives matter too and um it's tough you know like i can't work on that kind of work all the time constantly because it's just too much and the more you know hashtags are the more people i have to have to design and i have to to design you know post a four um gets to be too much sometimes so you know oftentimes in between time i have to do you know, I call them, you know, my little double that's on my shoulder, the little dumb projects where it's just like, I'm just doodling or drawing or doing collages and they don't have any sort of real meaning or anything. They're just, it's just work that I do just to kind of keep, keep myself making, right? So I don't, you know, um, kind of lose that. Cool. 
Um, I would say for me, it's, it's kind of the same, like on the level of Kim, where, you know, like you said, some folks woke up, I think it was around the verdict or not the verdict, but the decision not to um, try the police officer that killed Breonna Taylor. And my phone was going off and it was like, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? And I think that day somebody posted a, and this, this went viral, like check on your black friends or whatever. And I was like, I cannot be the only black friend of all of these wonderful people. So, so finally I was just like, I can't, I turned it off. I'm done. Um, I got to focus on my children and getting myself together. Um, I watch a lot of dumb, silly movies that have absolutely nothing to do with anything. Um, I watch cartoons. Um, I'll go for a walk or I'll just simply unplug or I'll cry. So those are the ways that um, I combat burnout. But it's okay if we charge back into it and it's okay if we have to step back out longer. Um, but for, you know, for those who are like, how can I help? How can I get into the space? What you're asking of us is then to like rehash those things. And so do the work, you know, Google and Facebook have plenty of resources. Um, we don't have to be your encyclopedia all the time. It's a difference between um, asking how we feel versus having to educate you on certain things. So, um, Nick Canchola, I hope I said that right. Sorry, Nick, if I butchered your name, says we've seen in the past how designers like Emory Douglas played an active role in political and social movements. What role do you believe graphic design plays in politics and social movement? says social in there. I feel like, Cam, you should answer that. I'll take a pass. I mean, so what, first, good question. Um, it's something I think about so much, right, that our craft, what we do, our superpower is the language of today. You know, I think that um, that probably, you know, made its, um, its like biggest appearance in maybe Obama's, you know, kind of like visual language campaign. I think that that hit home in terms of its, its strategy, the idea of hope how to harness hope, how to amplify hope graphically through, through language and communication. I think that's just one of the many examples. Um, yeah, I think that, I think in many ways we hold the key. It's why I, I care so much about what we do, right? If I were some ancillary role or some ancillary skill set, uh, I might feel sidelined, but I think we have the ability to craft the language, the narrative and the visual communication around uh, issues that matter. So. Um, what role? I think we are at the center of the conversation, and I think our role is one of the superpowers. Yes. Right. Um, and then on the flip side of that, you don't necessarily have to be the, this learned graphic design person to contribute to this. If you go back, 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 back to when protests have, have been protests, you will see design work. The graphic design is still a new phrase. It's not, it's still a baby. Um, as, as the way we know it now and it's ever changing. But keep in mind that, you know, protests and um, political whatevers, um, po advertising has been going on before we put a name to it. And so um, visual communication has always been a way, art has always been a way for um, people to express their way um, to make change. Um, think of the I am a man poster, right? Um, that was created. Um, and then, um, you know, with the women's creating the, sorry, the P word hats, <laughs> when, you know, the certain person was elected. So <laughs> the arts have always had a way to, um, to show through and be a part of the political and social movements that are going on. Um, definitely more so now because of technology and our connection around the world, but we don't have to, um, and I'm sorry, uh, teachers at, at Loyola, um, um, Marymount, um, but we don't necessarily have to be skilled in that. But if you want to craft something meaningful and making it so that we are um, telling a story intentionally and with respect, then yeah, you, you wanna have that training. You wanna have um, to, know, to be sensitive to that. So as you're moving forward, in that you can express yourself as a as a creative. Yeah. 
but and I'm just gonna I know this we're out of time, but just to add to that, but one thing I do want to say is that I do kind of see a movement that's it's it's kind of more about the content and the message and not about making things pretty. So just a reference back to the I am a man, like those were actual workers, right? That made those signs. They were not topographers, they were not, you know, um type designers, they weren't any of those things. They were just like a group of people that wanted an equal, you know, uh a livable wage, right? And so um yeah, I mean I think that's the other thing that's kind of interesting of where these design is right now is that, you know, we're not so concerned about, uh, well, I know I'm not, maybe I should speak for myself with the modernists fought for and their, their grids, the grid mix, <laughs> you know, it's like, who cares about that stuff? It's the, the medium is the, you know, it's the, it's about the message. It's about, you know, getting people to, um, sort of use their voices to, for change. And so not saying that, you know, good design isn't effective, it is, but I think that, um, yeah, less so now than before. So one more, uh, okay, so they say one more question, okay. All right, Laura Mitz, Mitzfeld, Mitzelfeld, please y'all, I'm so sorry. Um, so she says, um, or they say, I remember Tashika talking about her optimism for change in the upcoming generation. I'm curious to know how, oh, how Cameron and Aldrina feel. I'm going to throw it to you, Aldrina. You go first. Cool. Is that all right? <laughs> I have mixed feelings. To be honest with you, I have mixed feelings about yeah. all the things that are going on. Yeah. On the flip side, when I was a student here um, at Columbia College, I did graduate from here and I'm teaching here now. I was the only in the honors program and in the department, the only uh, woman of color. At that time, we were um, single gender education. So now as a teacher here, I cannot tell you how delightful it is to see all the folks, all the colors, all the all the um, spectrums here. It, it does my soul happy. And, in, and it's, it's, I think somewhat lost on my students because that's what, you know, they, they are used to seeing all of that, but that's not, that's not what my experience is. So in that case, I'm hopeful um, and, and optimistic and what they can do with their art and their talent to bring that forward. But at the same time, it's still like Tashika was talking about the pushing to get them in a space where they can articulately, uh, and eloquently talk about their experiences and not be afraid be, and that's you know have that safe space and i'm not going to throw shade at where i am or where i have been but there's still a lot of work to do to make sure that um they're able to do that and know that they have the power to do that and not experience um any kind of backlash because they want to talk about whatever is in their heart to create about so but um, yeah, so, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of flip, I flip flop. Ask me tomorrow on how I feel about that when I'm grading my students' works. But. <laughs> I love that. And very quickly, I'll say, I think I, I too, Aldrina, I'm cautiously optimistic. You know, um, we are in a different place than we were a generation ago and certainly uh, than we were a generation before that. My parents came to visit me uh, on the Facebook campus some years back and uh, they were very quietly in awe and, uh, my father, who had climbed the corporate train, chain in his, in his own career and eventually tapped out because he saw his limitations due to the color of his skin, uh, he said to me, oh, so this is what it looks like. And I said, what? And he's like, well, this is the future. And there are people of all walks of life, all colors, skin, all backgrounds, all of the diversity. We're not perfect. We're not perfect. But it looked very different than the corporate America that he knew. And, uh, and certainly a world that my, my grandparents couldn't have envisioned from Helena, Arkansas. So, you know, we are slowly making strides. It is our responsibility, no matter what color, no matter what walk of life, to carry the torch. Uh, and I take it very seriously, and I hope that everyone here does too. Thank you. I think that was it for questions. I can't see, so. Yeah, that's well done. Have anything else? Let me make sure. Yeah. Uh, oh. Oh no, that's an announcement about something for you students. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to Cameron. Thank you to Aldrina.
for um, being agreeing to be a part of this conversation. Um, I'm truly honored to um, have you as friends and colleagues. So thank you again. And thanks to Loyola Marymount for having us all um, be a part of your Friday. Well, I guess I was about to say afternoons or evenings, but I forget it's a different time zone, but be a part of your, you know, your early Fridays. And um, yeah, just thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. What a pleasure, what a pleasure. And thank you to Sheikha for including us and to Sari for inviting. Yay, thank you. You're Thanks seen, all. loved, we love you. Yeah, lots Take of love, care. be in touch.